Good evening, everyone. We continue our study in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 7. We continue from verse 27. We left off at verse 26 yesterday, and we were looking at the construction of the molten sea. It's a huge uh, basin of water that was sitting on top of 12 oxen, three in each direction. Now that's a magnificent, huge uh, copper or bronze construction. Now moving on into verse 27, we now look at another set of construction. It says here, and then, always notice after making that, Hiram was starting to make 10 stands of bronze. We say stands, uh, you will need to understand this as basis. The basis, the bottom part to hold something up. The length of each stand was four cubits. It's width four cubits, it's height three cubits. So we can actually imagine that again, I, I remind all of us, this is an artist's impression. They are not sufficient details in all areas to visualize, but it's enough for us to visualize something of the construction. So if you think, think of it this way, if this was a base, it would look something like this. So we have three cubits, four cubits, and, uh, and well, on the other side, I think you could see this as a three dimension. This also will be four cubits, right? Four cubits. Now let's continue on because we have many verses to cover. The design of the stands. This is about the design of the bases. Um, the design means the work of the bases. This is the 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 well, I guess you could call it the design, uh, the work, because this is what this word is. The work, uh, the 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 well, how would you say, the result of doing something, right? The result of doing something. And so I think the word design is good for this. The design of the stands that they had borders. Now understand that borders will mean that there is something that goes around, uh, which were, uh, which had cross bars. Now the word cross bars here actually means ledges, right? Ledges. So they had borders. Uh, and they had ledges. So let me see how to depict that. If this was a border that goes round, it stands out, right? It stands out. And so this is a border. And perhaps we have two rows of it. And so we have a ledge, right? And the ledge would be on top. So we have borders. And the ledge is on top. Now, the word ledge would be from an observer viewpoint that it is a, a, an open space. I think you can see it that way, an open space. Now, on the borders that were between the ledges. So let me just remove this and see. Okay, we have borders. I would show the borders, one on top and one at the bottom. I think that would be an easier way to, to depict it. And so in between the ledges uh, were carvings, right? Were carvings. So I could actually depict it this way. These were all carvings. And we had carvings of... Uh, Lions, oxen, cherubim. 
Now, oxen, lions, and cherubim, and later on, we will see another one called palm trees. So bear in mind, there are four motifs, and they are all set around the base. And this is the explanation that on the borders between the crossbar or the ledges were these motifs. And on the crossbar was a pedestal above, and beneath the oxen were wreaths of hanging work. So you could think of it that there are things that is hanging around, right? Hanging around. We don't know what it is. And then on top would be a pedestal. A pedestal would be a stand. And so now we can just look at this as a, a stand that is above the base. In verse 30, it says, Each stand has four bronze wheels. Now, these are four bronze or copper wheels with bronze axles no, or copper axles. And its four feet had supports. Beneath the basin were cast supports with wreaths on each side. So now we have supports. These are supports uh, beneath the basin. Uh, this would be beneath the basin. The basin should be put on top, right? The basin. But we have not seen the basin yet. So there are supports with wreaths on each side. So we could say that these would be like supports on top. And at the bottom would be supports. Right? These would be supports. And there were four, and there, there was an axle. Okay? The axle would look something like this. The axle would go across. And then we have wheels. Now, we won't draw the wheels yet because we need to have the dimension of the wheels. So we'll leave the wheels for a little later, but just for our interest so that I draw it ahead of time, it would be something like this. So let's continue in verse 31. Verse 31 tells us that the opening inside the crown uh, or the mouth of the, the top, right? The mouth of the top was a cubit. So now we can now put this in. This is one cubit. And its opening was round like the design of a pedestal. And it's a cubit and a half. And its opening also were engravings. Their borders were square, not round. And so now what we say is there is a hole at the top. And this is one and a half cubits in diameter. That's a hole. Right? That's an opening. All right? And then there were engravings. So we could actually talk about engravings uh, on the four sides as well. Like this. Engravings. All right? Verse 32. The four wheels were underneath the borders and the axles of the wheels were on the stand. And the height of the wheel was a cubit and a half. And so now we can say that the, this is one and a half cubits. So if this is one and a half cubits, we would say that this would be 2.5 cubits. And so this would approximate how that would look like. Right? Verse 33. The workmanship of the wheels were like workmanship of a chariot wheel. And so they were spokes. That would be how we would envision it to be in spokes. 
Their axles, their rims, their spokes, their, hub, their hubs are all cast. And this would be cast of uh, copper or what or we would call it uh, bronze, right? Now, there were four supports at the four corners of each stand. Its support were part of the stand itself. This is just to remind us that it exists here, right? These were the supports. Verse 35. And on top of the stand was a circular half a cubit high. And on the top of the stand, it stays as its border. And it was a part of it. And so we, we, we just have to understand that there was another piece. So on top of the stand was a circular form of half a cubit. Now, this... I guess in verse 35, we can say that this is on top of a base. On top of the base was a round compass of half a cubit high. And on the top of the base, its ledges, its borders were one piece. And so we can actually think of it this way, that there is a base on top of half a cubit, right? Of half a cubit. And he engraved on the plate of its stays and on the borders, cherubim, lions, palm trees. So now you can see uh, part of the four, right? Cherubim, lions, palm trees, uh, clear space on each with wreaths all around. And these would be the motifs, the pictures that would be uh, engraved on the corners of them. Now, there, by now we can see that there are Four types, right? Cherubim, lion, palm trees. And then earlier on, uh, we could see that there would have been the oxen or the cattle, right? The cattle as well. So that makes four. He made 10 stands like this. All of them had the same casting, same measure, same form. And so we're seeing this as 10 pieces, right? 10 pieces. So this will give us an idea of how that may look like. Now we learn of verse 38, and he made 10 basins of bronze or copper. These are lavers, wash basins, right? If you want to call it that way. Each holding 40 baths or 40 measures, each basin four cubits, and on each of the ten stands was one basin. So what you actually would see now, if we were to draw it, would look something like this. We would have a basin on top. Something like this. So the basin would be round. And that would be four cubits, exactly the dimensions of the base. But it would taper down and would sit on that hole that was on top, which is one and a half cubits. And this is made of bronze. Let's look at verse 39. Now, verse 39 tells us about the location. He placed the bases five on the right side of the house, which is the temple, five on the left side of the house, which is the temple, and he set the molten sea on the right side of the house eastward toward the south. Now, this is a bit of a challenge in terms of its location. So, let me just attempt to uh, draw it out. For us, if this was the temple, and then we have the porch, we have the two pillars, and then we also had the outer courtyard. And so, what we would now see is that first we have five on each side. Five on each side. Now, always remember, the temple always faces east. And so this would be north, 
south and west. And so five on the right, five on the left, and the house is here. So this is looking out. So this would be the right, and this would be the left on the north side. So five on the right, five on the left. The next thing is the sea of cast metal or the molten sea was on the right side of the house, which would be the right side of the house, eastward, which would be the east in front and toward the south. And so we can imagine this to be the southeast somewhere here. All right. With this, we have the sea of bronze, right? the molten sea. And so that would give us a picture of verse 39. Now in verse 40 onwards, we are going to read about some of the other things that Hiram is making. So what did Hiram make? Hiram made the basins. Uh, in verse 40, you would see the shovels, the bowls, uh, or we call it the basins, right? The bowls uh, to wash. So we have basins as lavas. These are the wash basins, the shovels, and the bowls that will keep the ashes. And Hiram finished doing all the work which he performed for the king, for King Solomon in the house of the Lord. I, I would imagine the, the fact that he is mentioned so often in chapter 7 makes him a very important uh, person in this work because he is filled with wisdom and judgment and insight as to how to deal with bronze or copper. So now we see in verse 41, the two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals, which were on top of the two pillars. This is a repeat of earlier on about what he framed in copper or, or bronze, the two lattices that cover the, the top of the pillars. Verse 42. The 400 pomegranates for the two lattices, this is actually making 400 pieces of pomegranates, little design in, uh, at the top of the pillars, two rows of them to cover the two bowls of the capitals on top of the pillars. And the 10 stands with the 10 basins. This would be the 10 bases with the 10 levers on the basis, and the one sea, this would be the molten sea, and the 12 oxen under the sea that would hold up the molten sea. Verse 45. And the buckets. Now, the buckets are also made of copper. The shovels, the bowls, all the utensils which Hiram made for King Solomon in the house of the Lord were of polished bronze. Now, polished bronze means that uh, it is shiny. Uh, how would you call this? This is made, made smooth. This is what the word actually means. It's made smooth. Uh, and so it's like a bald head, right? Smooth and shiny. Next, verse 46, the king had cast them in the plain of Jordan, which is actually the lower part of Jerusalem on the eastern side of Jerusalem, in the clay ground between Sukkot and, and, um, and, and, on the, let's see, verse 46. Zar, Zaratan, right? Zaratan. This would be a place where, because you would need a furnace to actually do the casting, to melt the copper and then to put it into cast for it to, 
to uh to to cool down so that you can have the huge cost and then bring it all the way to the temple verse 47 however solomon left all the utensils now the idea here is not left the left the utensils alone but this word is good did not weigh the utensils so that we, we do not know how heavy they were because there were too many. The weight of the bronze could not be determined. Uh, and the idea here is the weight of the, the utensils cannot be found out. And so this would be a, a way of expressing it. They, it's unknown. I think that would be the intent of the Hebrew word. Next, in verse 48, Solomon also made all the furniture. Now, when we call this the furniture, it is also uh, kelem, that would be the vessels, really. The vessels, not the furniture. or I would say the utensils. That was in the house of the Lord, what did he make? The golden altar, the golden temple of showbread, right? And this would, would tell us that this was where the, um, the showbread was set. This is the showbread. And so we have the table of the showbread, the incense altar which was also gold. Then we have the lamb stands also of gold. Five on the right side, five on the left. In front of the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lambs, the tongs of gold. Now, what does that mean? It appears to us that there, there were lamb stands of gold, five on the left, five on the right. And so if this was separated, there would be, Five, three, four, five, and then five on this side. Four and five. This is what it means. And then we have the the show uh, the the incense altar, and then we have a table of showbread. They were all gold. Now, for us to understand how the rest were made, we should go and check out the book of Exodus because the patterns were given to Moses, who then were given to the artisan of the day. And so in the same instance, the artisan of the day here would be Hiram, and he made all these things of copper. But Solomon made the rest in gold, also the cups, and uh, this word here in verse 50, uh, cups would be bowls. Those days, they, they are, they're all bowls. Um, well, this word shears may be a bit tricky. The word here actually means some, some form of a musical instrument. Right, some form of a musical instrument. Now, I don't know what form it is, but it is a musical instrument. Uh, then we have the bowls, which is the basins. Uh, the ladles. The spoons. Right, These are the spoons. Then we have the fire pan. And the fire pan would be the senses. And they are all of pure gold. The hinges for the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, the doors of the house, the main room, they're all gold. Now, these are the hinges. Right? These are the hinges. Now, we come to the last verse of this chapter. The last verse of this chapter in verse 51 now tells us this. And this is where I want to spend some time on. He says here, and then, 
all the work that King Solomon did, right? All the work uh, that King Solomon uh, was doing was completed. The word finished here uh, comes from the word uh, shalom, right? This word here is shalom or shalem, right? Shalem. Now understand this. In the Hebrew word, we know shalom. But shalom really is a derivative of the verb shalem. Shalem means to make complete. Uh, that we are, we have finished doing what was set to do. And once it is completed, the result of the completion of the shalem will be shalom. Now, that is how we get the word shalom. Although we call it peace, right? We refer to shalom as peace. Uh, for our purposes today, since we have this word here called shalem, uh, the word shalom is derived from this word shalem. So peace offering is actually a shalem offering. The peace offering would be in regards to completing a vow or completing a promise or completing doing certain things that is promised to God. And you make an offering to signify the completion and thereby have peace with God, shalom. And so bear in mind the word shalom means peace, but it is a peace that is derived from completing everything that was set out to do for God. And so the work that King Solomon had done in the house of God was shalem. And then he says, And Solomon brought the offerings vowed by his father David. Now, this is not really the offerings, okay? Um, we would say that these would be the, the things that, that David had dedicated, had set apart, right? These would be things set apart, right? The offerings vowed is actually things set apart or dedicated by David. So this is really not offering in, in the sense, right? Not, not, not something to offer to God. And this would be the silver, the gold, the utensils. And he put them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and this would become the wealth of the treasury so that the priests and the Levites would be able to use them to perform the work of God. And so this is not an offering of a sacrifice, but if you like to look at it as a modern day's offering, that's fine. But these are literally things that David had set aside that when the temple is in operation, there is money to finance the operation of the work of God in the temple. And with this, I trust that we have a complete understanding as much as we can with an artist's impression, right? We have the pillars made. We have the molten sea. Now, the molten sea, if you go back, uh, let me just write it down here. For the molten sea, if you go back and read Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 to 21, you find that it is designed for the priests to do washing, washing their hands and feet. Then we have the lavers. Now, these are the lavas, the ten of them. You can go back and read 2 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 6. And it's designed to use to wash the burnt offering. And there are ten of them. And so we have just concluded that there are many utensils 
and many things that has been made. Uh, many th of the things outside were was cast in bronze or copper, and then many of the utensils that were made by Solomon were all in gold. And with this, uh, the treasury would be stocked up with wealth to operate. And so by the end of chapter 7, we would see what David had passed on to Solomon. And Solomon had completed everything that was done. And the idea here is shalem. And there is shalom in the land. And with this, we come to the end of our session today.